Here are some important reminders to help ensure that you and your family are safe. Wash your hands thoroughly and regularly with antibacterial soap for at least 20 seconds. When soap and water are not readily available, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Please try to avoid crowded places and make sure you are at least one to two meters away from others. Never leave the house without your face mask and face shield. Make sure your face mask covers your nose down to your mouth. Get vaccinated. Register with your local government unit. Remember that the best vaccine is what's available to you right now. Make the most out of the online services that are available today. If you must leave your home, please sanitize your belongings and bathe immediately upon return. Remember, WOW 2.0. Wash your hands. Observe social distancing. Wear your face mask and face shield. Get your two shots. Please attend our online services and meetings. Our safety is of utmost importance so that when we physically gather again together as a church, no one will be missing. Be safe. Thank you. Welcome, my name is Johan and I will be your online usher for today's online service here at Without Walls Ministries. If this is your first time, I would like to invite you to go check our website later that is withoutwalls.ph. There you could have a quick introduction of who we are and what we do as a church. There are also useful links and information on how to give, your tithes and offering, how to connect through our life groups and WOW Wednesdays and how to serve. That's right. Speaking of serve, I would like to take this time opportunity to appreciate the people who are in service, who are in ministry. Um, I know that these times are very difficult times for most of us and still these people, uh, the online ushers, the priest worship team, um, the media team, the pastoral team, everyone is really working together, uh, still being able to give their best so that every Sunday we would have an online service. And that happens every week. And so amazing. Um, I want to appreciate you and remind you that the Lord is not only a good father, he is also a great reward. He's a good employer. He sees your thoughts, your hands, the works of your hands, and He blesses you. And may the Lord bless you accordingly. And um, this is also a great opportunity to invite everyone who has the heart to serve. Um, if you have the desire to give and lend your talents, 
uh, please email us at info at withoutwalls.ph. Before we start, I would like to read to you Psalms 84 verse 4. It says, Blessed, blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Let me repeat that. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Think for a moment and hold that thought. The word calls you blessed. And with that thought in mind, let us sing our praise to the Lord. Come behold the wondrous mystery In the dawning of the King He the theme of heaven's praises Robed in frail humanity In our longing, in our darkness Now the light of life is gone to Christ who condescended took on flesh to ransom us come behold the wondrous mystery he the perfect son of man in his Suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hellbound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in. Christ the Lord upon the tree In the set of throwing sinners Hangs the Lamb in victory See the price of our redemption See the Father's plan unfold Bringing many sons to glory Unmeasured love untold Come behold the wondrous mystery Slain by death, the God of life But no grave could ever restrain him Praise the Lord The Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss 
that father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory Behold a man upon a cross My sin upon his shoulder Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 14 to 17 but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful, wonderful day, another opportunity to hear the Word of God, the Word that is alive, the Word that is breathed out by you able to transform us to be more Christ-like. We thank you and we ask help to open our eyes, open our hearts, our ears, our minds, that we would be able to receive what you have prepared, specially made for us today. We ask this with a thankful, thankful heart. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is John, and although I had not been scheduled to preach this week, eventualities have led to my being offered to preach the Word of God again for you today. <clears throat> and I must say that any opportunity to preach the gospel is a privilege that I need to be grateful to the Lord for, and I am, so that we can make much of the Lord in our lives and in our families and in our church 
and uh, surely, purposefully in the community that we find ourselves in. Um, hopefully, you've been uh, continuing to keep safe, especially amidst, amidst this surge. And as you've been keeping safe, and as you had been surely looking out for one another, uh, each other's needs, I pray that you would continue to pray for your pastors and their families as well, who had been indirectly or directly and in, in, in varying degrees affected by this virus as well. Uh, please reach out to them. I'm sure they'd be glad to hear from you and to know that you've been praying for them. Thank you. Um, since it's still the, the new year um, and every one of us is still sustaining our uh, New Year's resolutions, um, I'd want to be able to share to you some points of my New Year's resolutions. Uh, now, admittedly, uh, these are roughly the same from the past year or so. And uh, just five items from, I think, 10 or 12 I have listed down. Um, surely, in the midst of uh, what we've been through in the past 18 months or so, I need to have less worry and more prayer. That's item number one. Less spending and more giving. That's really self-explanatory. Less complaining and more thanksgiving. Less hurry, more lingering conversations. I'm carrying conversations longer than I, I, I used to be carrying them because of well, social media and technology. Speaking of which, fifth item is less social media, less media, more Bible in books in that order. I need to have the Bible primary in my life so that the Lord can continue to teach me things personally. Now it's the start of the year and I've been praying on what I wanted to, to talk with you about today. Um, since I shared with you some points of my New Year's res resolutions, uh, let me say, say that uh, sadly, um, may, though many Christians have included reading more of the Bible in their New Year's res resolutions, like many resolutions, this too ends up to be not sustained. Proof of, proof of the matter is that many of us are so familiar with the stories of Genesis and even the stories of the Exodus. But when it comes to the middle of, ex of Exodus, when it comes to the loss, then we stop. Not too many are familiar uh, with the Bible from that point on. Now, I love reading. I love, I love books. I love new books. I'm very excited to be having books that I really like. Um, I've been gifted study, a study Bible last year, in which I really like as well. I've gifted my wife and a couple of friends with the Gospel Transformation Bible. And uh, it's wonderful if you haven't checked it out yet. You might want to get one for yourself. It'll be a treat for you, the Gospel Transformation Bible. Um, in as much as I love study Bibles, I need to say, in saying all that, is I'm fascinated with the Bible. Just God's Word. No, I mean, comments and, and notes are extremely helpful. But the most productive and the healthiest time that I could ever spend with God is just spending time with Him in the Word, getting familiar with this one overarching story that the Bible, His Bible, is about. I, I would suggest that if you haven't read the Bible all the way through, to resist the urge to get yourself a study Bible. You get a Bible, just the Bible, because usually it's a new Bible that would, that would, uh, that would rekindle, uh, a desire for us to start reading the Bible again. If it take, if it's, if that's what it takes for you, please go ahead and get the best Bible that you can get, but don't get a study Bible just yet, because with a study Bible, it, it actually presumes that you've already cultivated the discipline of reading the Bible all the way through and finding out what it's all about in its context. Because a, a study Bible without that discipline could be something that's deceiving. You think you're there, but you're really not there, if you get my drift. So get the Bible, read it, cultivate the discipline of reading it, and the, the, the discipline of running to it. I've been asked the question, so how do you read the Bible? It's, I didn't say this out loud, but I just had it in my head. Um, what are you talking about? Just open it and read it. 
in in a way you need to cultivate that discipline of just opening it and reading it but preferably in a particular place in a particular time every day if possible but since we're still in january i wanted to talk to you about the bible and what christians ought to do with it going a little bit farther than just opening it and reading it how are we supposed to look at the bible and how are we to recognize what the bible is looking to do in us now we, let me read two verses the first two verses of the four verses that we read today uh, this is paul instructing timothy um a pastor that he had been raising up in uh, a church that he had been uh, leading, that there will be the church in Ephesus. He's already a Christian, needless to say, but Paul is saying, here is what you need to remember for your growth. And before your leadership, you need to ensure your growth as a Christian. So verse 14, Paul says, But as for you, which stops us on our tracks. Why? Because of the prep prepositional word, but. But as for you, why is it there? So we need to backtrack a bit, maybe a couple of verses, but just one verse up does it, I find. Verse 13 talks about evil people and imposters. Now, imposters can only mean people who claim to be Christians, but have nothing to show for. No change. Are you really Christian if you're not changing? Then we slide into verse 14. But as for you, if you want to grow in your Christianity, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Knowing from whom you learned it talks about the reliability of people who had been sharing the gospel to you. Are these people preaching gospel? This is what God had done? Or are they preaching morality? This is what you need to do. And this is how you are to find it in the Bible. Are they reliable? Um, it also, verse 15 also talks about comprehensibility. comprehensibility. Um, know from childhood, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. It is so gracious and so thoughtful of God, I think, that He would write it in such a way that can be simple enough. It takes some work to understand it, and it takes some work to, to, to be familiar with it. The, the substitution and the reversal that only the good news of God brings, but it can be packaged enough without diluting it that even children can be made to understand it talks about the comprehensibility of Scripture, which really throws away all of our excuses not to read it. It tells us that the Bible is for our continued growth and transformation. This is what it means when Paul says, this will make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Make you wise for salvation. If you're truly Christian, it needs to show in the ways that it needs to show to the people around you. When you hear the word Bible, referred to by sacred writings in verse 14, what comes to mind? When I say Bible, what comes to mind? Book, right. The etymology or the root word of the word Bible, the English word Bible, is actually book. And uh, it is a book. It is a big book, the most important book ever and surely for your life. But uh, this is why it's, it's also referred to in verse uh, 16 as Scripture singular. But isn't it the case that the Bible is also referred to as the Scriptures? Why? Because we need to understand that the Bible is comprised of many books. So it, it, it won't be ill-advised for you to think of it as a library with many sections for different, for different genres that God had chosen to write through. Um, there, there are books on the law, Book, there the, are the wisdom books and the historical narrative books, the books by the prophets, the, there are the, the gospel accounts, and there are the epistles, uh, which is really like a, a really a smart sounding way to say letters of uh, different apostles to New Testament churches. And it is in one of these epistles that we can study what the Bible is about and how we should glean from it. So let's continue reading the main text that we want to study, verses 16 to 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, 
for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God or woman may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now let's start. Verse 16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God. Now Paul essentially coins a new compound word. In Greek, theonoustos, God breathed. It's basically saying, this has life, the life of God, because it was God himself who brought it about. It is the wisdom of God, the counsel of God. In the, the, theological terms, this is called inspiration. The inspiration of scripture. Now, I follow certain authors, and you would hear me say, I like the books that this particular person wrote. But consider this, that the Bible is the book that God wrote. Shouldn't you be reading the book that God wrote? I think you should. And it'll be great. It'll be pertinent. Very important for us to get the context and the true meaning of the book that God wrote. Not to let the cat out of the bag, but the Bible, with its many amazing stories, is just one story. One overarching story of God's love for us. More on that in a bit, but it is breathed out by God. It is divine in nature. And proof of this divine origin is the fact that God uses about 40 different authors, very few of them uh, contemporaries with each other, over a period of 1,500 years, and there are no discrepancies. And some might say, critics of the Bible say, but there are discrepancies. No. But if you, if you would just treat it with the same scholarship as you would in inspecting any work of literature, you would find that everything is in context, considering all of the cultures that the Bible was written to and in, that there are no discrepancies. There are variances that are called, there are just small errors in transmission. Just making copies, we have a photocopy machine in time nayon. Small variances that the Lord allows for, but the Bible had been very transparent with because of the footnotes that we find ourselves in. And this, this should breed in us such a, uh, a feeling of safety that the Bible is trustworthy and reliable in this way. These variances, not, not, not even in one place, threatens one doctrine taught in the Bible. So, one last thing, uh, this, this idea that the word, the word of God is breathed out by God, it refers to the words more than it does to the authors. It does refer to the authors, but the author had only been inspired for that brief moment that he had been written that particular work. He had no intention of writing scripture, but God in his sovereignty says, I'm going to be using this time that he's writing that letter, who is writing that chronology, that I'm going to be using that. It's man's words, but those are my words ultimately. But since words convey thoughts, we need to be students of context. In light of what verse 14 says, what we have learned and have, what you have learned and have firmly believed, why did he say this? There is uh, a, a version that is correct, that had been taught to us, that would make us Christians, effectually. Our sins have been wiped away. We have been considered to be now be children of God. But there is so much more to this than we just knew at that particular time. If we just spend time in studying this, it propels us forward into the depths of the wondrous truths about God. So, and this is what brings transformation. I personally don't think that the Bible is meant to be read in small chunks, bits of wisdom that is so easy to subscribe to in various Bible apps. I think the Bible is, reading the Bible requires us to hold a train of thought over a period of many days, depending on what book or what topic we're reading about. We need to daily pick it up. Nasa na nga ba ako? When you're reading in Romans 8 verse 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a victorious saying, therefore, but we need to ask why that word therefore is there for. It actually invites us to rehearse what we've read in Romans 7, even back to Romans 6, so that we can prime ourselves 
uh, our hearts up and posture ourselves properly to truly be gracious to the Lord. Wow, there is now no condemnation. The law of sin and death is, is done for because of what God has done. Romans 12 verse 1 is the same thing. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your life as a living sacrifice to God. What do you think? Therefore, in that particular verse, is inviting you to revisit. I pray that we be children of context. Just one, if, if you would allow me for uh, a quick practical tip. I hope you'd find this practical. And uh, like, like many things that technology affords us, like social media, it's a very helpful tool, but it's very wicked, Master. Uh, many of us have, uh, all of us have phones, and some of us have tablets, and we can read the Bible there. And it's very convenient. And I'm not saying it can't be done, but it'll just be so easy, much so much easier to be a student of context when you have an actual book, because you can flip the pages. Romans 8, therefore, I need to review what Romans 7 says. But nga sinabi to? So we're able to flip and you're able to get to the context right away, which is, I think is very important in reading Scripture. In my phone or on your tablet, all you have is a screen that you scroll. It's a window that you scroll and you can easily get tired of scrolling because I don't know where, where I am. Parang nawala na ako sa binabasa. O wag na nga. So never mind context. I just need to tick that box. I've read today's reading. We need to be students of context. And it'd be so easy to. And besides, hopefully before too long, we're able to meet one another. Nothing sounds better to a pastor's or a preacher's ears than pages of the Bible turning. Um, a, a, a good question at this point would be, but why are there different translations? Well, because the Bible wasn't written in English or Tagalog. It was written in ancient languages. Ancient? How? Um, people who are naturally speaking Greek or Hebrew would even find it hard, difficult. It's not not doable, but it's like you reading Balagtas or English-speaking people reading uh, Shakespeare or Old English or the King James Version. Good thing there's the New King James Version. Um, we need to understand that the, the, the books in the Bible are written to a different group of people in a different place, in a different time, with different cultures and different challenges that we really need to do the work of analyzing what God's words meant to them so that we can consider in our hearts what, we are, what, what effect it should have in us today with all the things that we're encountering today. Um, there are generally two different ways of translation. Let me tell you about them very quickly. The, th the thought for thought and the word for word. Thought for thought is generally how you would uh, translate. If you've ever translated something from Tagalog to English, this is generally how you would go about it. Thought for thought. You would take the whole meaning as you understand it, and then you would use the appropriate words that come to you quickest to, to approximate that meaning. Take for example, anong tinapos mo? Oh, he's asking what you finished. What do you mean? What, what I, fin I, I finished? I just finish, finished eating. No, what you're asking with that question, another tenapos mo, is what course did you take up in college? What collegiate course did you take up in university? Um, and that doesn't translate well in English. So thought for thought is, is needing to be responsible in, in handling colloquialisms like this. The NIV and the NLT are good thought for thought versions. But then it's not just the thoughts that are conveyed that are important, but the very words that are inspired by God. That the, the, they are the ones that are inspired by God. Um, Psalm 119 says, Your word is firm in the heavens. Your words are eternal. So I'm so grateful that some people would choose to translate the Bible in this way, word for word. Okay? If there's one word that I would choose to describe the word for word translation, it's precision. Precision in conveying the original word meanings and its effect to the text. I have a telescope and when, for example, even as something as big, considerably big as the moon compared to the stars, you have two knobs that you need to, to, to work with precision. Otherwise, 
lalagpas ka. You can, where's the moon again? I can't find it. You need to, to be very, very precise in your turning of the knobs. You realize, wow, the, the sky's a big place. Ang hirap mahanap ng buwan. So word for word, handling the word of God with precision. The Bible says, handling the word of God rightly, the truth of God rightly. It's good for study. Um, yung, uh, what we handled earlier is, uh, so what do you mean? A word for word would say, uh, yung, anong ibig mong sabihin? What would you wish to say compared to what do you mean? Though both are relevant and both are important, both are very helpful. Um, so where's the message? The message translation, some of you might be asking. It's a paraphrase. So if this is where a uh, word for word is, and this is where thought for thought is, this is where, um, a paraphrase is. It emphasizes readability without, by paying, uh, even less attention to word patterns. My personal opinion is that this is a, a, a great, a valid way to start reading scriptures. But if maturity comes with learning and studying, you really need to work yourself up to thought for thought and then perhaps word for word. I would suggest to have a good thought for thought translation, NIV or NOT, and a good word for word translation, ESV, NASB, or the New King James Version um, in your household. A word of caution, though, it's uh, there. There are no perfect translations. There are strengths and weaknesses in all of them. But for you to say that there's only one translation, it's either this translation and or no translation. That's proud and that's ill-advised. But some Christians say that we need to be students of Scripture, so we need to enjoy multiple translations as gifts. Um, I need to say. This excludes the New World Translation, however. Uh, that's a corruption, not a translation. Um, so we've talked about how God inspired Scripture. Now let's talk about why. I want to talk to you uh, about these things under three headings with the remaining time that we have. The importance of inspiration, the authority of inspiration, the, and the objective of inspiration. The importance, the authority, and the objective of inspiration. First, the importance of inspiration. Verse 16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God. Now, every one of us, most of us are in Genesis as we start the year off. So you're refamiliarizing yourself with the stories of creation and Abraham. So we know that in Genesis 1 and 2, God is the giver of life. He, he gives the breath of life to every living being. He even breathes it in the nostrils of, of Adam and made him into a living creature. But it made me think when I got to Genesis 1.31 where it says, God looked at everything that he had made, that he had breathed into, and saw that it was good. So the original order of creation, something that he had breathed to, was something very good. But looking around us, there are, there are many things that aren't good at all. So I think God uses this same word, but in the Greek, to say, I'm breathing into this word to tell you how I'm going to fix the things that are broken around you. You can't fix it. I'm the one who's going to need to fix it. And here's how. I think it assumes that something had gone terribly wrong with God in the God-breathed original state of creation. I want to give you two, two quick reasons on why God's word is of utmost importance. First, God's word is of utmost importance because the ways of God are counterintuitive. Counterintuitive. Have you ever tried to to go about a particular tool, like uh, yung yung can open can opener na hindi pa paikot or yung electric yung ganon? If you don't handle that well, you will hurt yourself. You will draw blood, and you would usually hear some some uh, relatives say, "Hindi ganon ang paggamit niyan, malay malay malay, masusugat na kanyan." It's counterintuitive. Um, like I told you, it's, I have a telescope, but, uh, it's a Newtonian telescope in that it's for looking at stars. But for you to have the, the best clarity, the image is inverted. So when you're looking at the moon and when it's, pag medyo nasa taas siya, so you want to turn it up, di ba? No. Because it's, dahil baliktad yung image, you really need to turn it down so that you can look up. 
It's counterintuitive. It's difficult and it, it takes some getting used to. The same thing with the things in Scripture. Counterintuitive, what am I talking about? For you to be great, you need to be a servant. For you to live, you need to die. For you to rest, you need to carry this yoke. For you to be exalted, you need to humble yourself. For you to be weak, then you can be strong. Counterintuitive, and it's wonderful. It tugs on the heart as noble, and people, when they hear this, that's a really good thing. But really, in their hearts and in their minds, they're saying that's untenable. You can, no one can really do that. Ano mo pag-iiwanan ka? Dalin mo sa sales yan, mapag-iiwanan ka. Life's more complicated than that. Well, should we be expecting any less from God's Word? This is the counsel of God. The, 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 the breathed out scriptures that God gave us to tell us, here's how I will fix the world. It assumes that there's something broken in the world. So of course it will fly against the ways that the world thinks. We're so used to fake things. I mean, fake sand, fake beaches. Um, compare that to real beaches. I mean, it pales in comparison. Without an idea of what the real things are, puede na to. And it could be rather be enjoyable. In New Valley, there's a, a man-made lake. There's even a sense of pride when you use that, that term man-made, no? But have you, have you ever been early morning to, right next to Ta'al Lake? There's no wind. It's a little bit chilly and it's glass-like. And you could see the, the island and the volcano. Uh, reflected on it. It's staggering. It's wonderful. It pales in comparison to anything that man is able to make for itself and call it man-made. Kami may gawa niyan. See, everything that man can ever do compared to what God can do is it pales in comparison. God truly knows better, not just in beauty, but in life. This is what this text is all about. God knows better in your life. It might sound counterintuitive, it doesn't make sense. It's, you might even think it foolishness, but this is the way to life. God's way is the only way to life. The world's ways doesn't... The Bible doesn't only say that the world's ways pales in comparison to God's ways, but the world's ways leads to destruction. This is why the Word of God is of utmost importance. Another thing is that God's word is of utmost importance because the ways of the world are deceptive. If you would remember, you, you, we actually read about this in verse 13. It's insidious. You think it's good for you, but it's really not. It, 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 it feels good at that time lang. So this is the wisdom of the world, eh? uh, hedonism. Whatever feels good, go do it. Go get it. No one is going to tell you that that's wrong. This is the age that we live in now. You'd be a bigot or you'd be narrow-minded when you call somebody out that that's wrong. But this is actually foolishness. But they won't call it foolishness. You know it's foolishness because many of these things would lead, would lead to regret. Regret would say it really felt good. It, it, it really felt like a good idea back then. Because you know what? It, it, you have believed the lie that sin has no consequences. Not because everybody else is doing it, but you can do it and expect no consequences. Now that is foolishness. Now there is something that the world calls foolishness. And that is the words of God. That is the things of the word of God. But really, the word of God says, God uses the foolish things, the things that the world calls foolish, to shame the wise. God's truth will prove to be the only truth. And this is what we find in the Word of God. See, the lie of the world, the world is that, you know what, whatever you believe, it doesn't matter. Just love yourself and love people around you. The greatest gift of all is love and be sincere. The whole premise of that is erroneous, foolish even. For example, if you uh, were if you were swimming and you jumped off a of a boat, a bangka, 
and then you had a cramp and you're drowning and you're calling out to the, your, your friends on, on the boat saying, throw me something, I'm drowning. Uh, I have I have a bowling ball here or I have a beach ball. What do you want? I don't care. Whatever it is, I'll hold, hold on to it sincerely and that will save me. Many people are sincere. Sincerity is so important in faith. But even more important, exponentially important, is what you actually believe in. Many people around us are holding on to what they believe, but it's pulling them down to their depths. This is why the Word of God is so important. The world's, the world's ways are deceptive. Psalm 19, verses 7 and 8, David would say, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. We need this. That's the importance of inspiration. Let me talk to you about the authority of inspiration. Verse 16 continues to say, All scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Wow, that word, righteousness. You don't just detect there a common sense of do this because this will be good for you. No, it's righteousness, such a big daunting word, gives you a holy sense of requirement. Again, Psalm 19, verses 7 and 8, you would notice that we read, the law of the Lord is perfect. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Law and commandment, there is an unmistakable authoritative nature in the word of God. We have been created to be relational people. And as relational people, God made us to be in submission to someone. Whether in our local context, to our parents, to the law enforcers, to to, uh, the leaders in church. But ultimately, we're all to submit to God. We are made in that way. Um, And these people in authority need to be in a position that they can say, you're wrong. It's not really a personal relationship with God if your version of God can't tell you that's wrong. Sadly, so many people, self-professing Christians, are having this version of God that can't disagree with them, can't tell them they're wrong, and that won't be any help to them. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the second second commandment. So what is this, that that we would grow in righteousness? We, we need to be able to recognize the commandment of God for us to be holy as the Lord is holy. If we say that we belong to God, it really needs to show in how our lives are run, how our lives are lived, how we're transformed. How does it happen then? It's right here. Teaching, reproof, correction, and training, one after the other. First, it's a process. Teaching. We need to behold God's ways. We need to hold the true form of what God had taught originally. It's holy. It's righteous. Then, reproof. After looking at and beholding what God's ways are, we need to look at our own ways, considering our ways as we lived as our own gods. It's fallen. It's self-righteous. It offers fleeting satisfaction. It's lang but... Wala na agad, and only ever caused frustration and regret. Teaching, reproof, and correction. Hopefully, in comparing God's ways and your ways, you would say, you know what, I need to change my mind. I need to change my heart. Correction is repentance and recalibration. We know all about recalibration. I've come to a change of my mind, and this is what rehabilitation centers are all about. Admit that you were in the wrong, And you need to change your ways for your good. We need to come to a point that we, that we need to admit humbly, I had always been wrong and God had always been right. I had only ever been rebellious to God. God had only ever been patient and merciful and loving of me. Correction. And lastly, training in righteousness, walking in the ways of God. 
um, walking is an idiomatic expression for the, for the Jews that, that would encompass the whole course of your life. Every single thing that you do in your life, you do it in God's ways. Moving forward in faith, living by faith. And it, it needs to be said that this particular item, training in righteousness, needs to be, will only prove hypothetical if you're stuck on an island and nobody else is with you. Um, because realize that most of the things that have gone wrong in us as relational beings is relational in nature. It affects relationships. It affects other people. It has relational ramifications. So God breathed, God breathed scripture so that it can work not just in us, but it can work in us as a community. We need community to work this out. We have blind spots, you see. Um, a good percentage of automobile accidents is because of their blind spots. Wala, wala pa sa rear view mirror, wala na sa side view mirror. All of us have blind spots as well. And I don't expect for you to know about this because we're blind to these spots. But it's clear as the nose on your face to many other people. And you would really just need to count on them to say, I need to talk to you about this. But if you're not on, um, but see, you're, we're not in an island and we're called by God to one another, to each other, to a community, to a church, and to live out this, to live this out in community with one another as God designed, as people, uh, see the transformation that the gospel alone can bring. John Cal Calvin would have this to say, we are saved by faith alone, but we are saved by faith alone, but faith that saves is never alone. It means again, it needs to show. It needs to affect people around us. In a word, faith in God would, would result in a transformation that brings obedience in us. In a word, that is how we know that we're being transformed in this way. That's how we know that we're living in righteousness if we're living in obedience. Very quickly, two kinds of obedience, active obedience and passive obedience. Active obedience is seeking God's commands and setting your heart on doing them. That's active. Passive obedience naman is ongoing surrender, ongoing submission to God, knowing that in your heart, nasanay ka na may genius ka na ibe. But when the, the Lord, the Lord would impress in your heart or impressing you through scripture saying that's going to have to be a no in that particular prayer request you're going to be you're going to have to be okay with that you need to have to be to be able to say not my will be done but your will be done hopefully it's clear i know it's kind of close but active is purposefully living the purposes of god and passive is saying you know what you're my lord not me how does this look like? I picked up one verse that would, that would show this to us. Ephesians 4 verse 28. How is, if a thief became a Christian, what would happen? Let the thief no longer steal. But is that enough for the, for the thief not to just steal? To, to just, uh, to just be, uh, passive obedient? No, he has to be actively obedient as well. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Do you see what transformation entails? It should affect the people around you. And this segues into what verse 17 says, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Good work always benefits others. My question to you, do others benefit from your faith? Do others benefit from your life? And lastly, we need to end with the gospel, the objective of inspiration. Verse 17 says that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We need to take this in context. Religiously, this particular verse would appears to tell us that we must become this, so you need to work to becoming this. Work so that you can have good work. Good works. Well, it's true that true transformation causes us to change our ways and to be even missional. 
to affect the people around us, the community around us, to become. We are to become something else. But not primarily. Not primarily. If you take become, become this to be primary, that's religiosity. That's morality. And that never saves. That can only bring about frustration. Really, how much is enough? How much giving is enough? How much praying is enough? How much serving is enough? What we need to do this, we need to become this. What we need is a reason. Again, Psalm 19 verse 7, David tells us, The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Realize that the testimony of the Lord is a synonym for Scripture. There is one who said, These are the very Scriptures that testify about me. The Bible is God-breathed because the testimony of the Lord needs to be told. The Bible is breathed out by God because the gospel needs to be told. For the Bible to be able to make us men and women of God, complete and prepared for every good work, the true man of God needed to complete a very important work, the ultimate good work. You see, God is holy. And we had only ever been disobedient. And uh, God in His holiness will have nothing to do with sinful, disobedient people. And there is no way for us to earn our way back into that station. But the Bible says, Jesus Christ lived a sinless life and He gave it to us. The Bible also tells us that we need to pay for our sins and we gave our sins to Him. Do you see the reversal that the Gospel alone brings? All His life, Jesus displayed perfect, active obedience, living a sinless life, doing the will of the, of, of the Father. And on the cross, Jesus displayed perfect, passive obedience, submitting to the will of God, dying in our place for our sins as our Savior the sacrificial lamb for our souls. On the cross, Jesus, who was eternally obedient, was treated as one who had been gravely disobedient. So that you and I, who had been gravely disobedient, can be treated eternally obedient. This, the gospel, prepares us for every good work. This is our reason. The amazing thing is that Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He died for our sins, it's true. But do you know that He died for even an entirely bigger thing than that? More than just dying for our sins, He died for our sinfulness. Even the sins that you haven't even gotten to, the Lord says, I've got that covered. You go on living your life Worshipping me, following me, doing my will. I will see you when the time comes and give you that warm, big embrace saying, Well done, good and faithful servant. That is our reason. So the text isn't just telling us to become like Christ. Rather, we need to behold Christ. Then become like Christ. In that order one being the effect of the other. We behold Christ, then we become like Christ. We just don't do good work. We rehearse the gospel story, which compels us to do every good work. It's like a maintenance pill. I don't know if you know this. If, you have, if you're still not taking it, a day is coming when you will start taking it. Uh, when, you, when you don't take your maintenance pill, if it's not taken, it will have adverse effects. You'll have palpitations. It's the same thing. If you don't partake of the gospel, preach the gospel to yourself every day, you will forget. And you will see that you will become even, you will become self-centered again. That you, you, your life will not benefit other people around you again. Behold Christ. Become like Christ. He's Savior first. Example second. You cannot figure this out without Scripture. 
you cannot carry this out without Scripture and the grace of God that carries with the preaching of the gospel. Now, if you're not living on an island, I'm sure you're not living on an island, but you, but you very well could be. Are you choosing to live on an island? Are you choosing to be by yourself? If you want to truly grow and put these in action, there's no other way but to relate with God by relating with people around you. Then and only then can you start seeing the transformation that the gospel alone brings by the Spirit of God can be manifested clear for all to see and benefit from. I pray that this will be true of you this year as you spend purposeful time in the Word of God. Can you bow your heads with me today? Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. We thank you for, in Scripture, we read that you reveal of yourself as a God who reveals of yourself generously, lovingly, wanting to have a relationship with us. We thank you for the grace that you have given us to understand what the gospel truly means. It both assumes the worst case scenario for us and the best case scenario for us. We recognize that left to our own selves and our devices, there is no hope. Because of our sins, because of our self-centeredness, we are lost without any hope of rescue. But thank you that the gospel also, also tells us that you and Jesus, the true man of God, who is God himself that you've sent, had accomplished absolutely everything for us, that we are more accepted than we ever dare imagine. You do not love a future version of ourselves. You love us as we are. But I thank you, Lord, that this truth, when we consider it, is the very truth that will propel us towards Christ-likeness. So much gratitude, so much affection cultivated in our hearts that could not, that could only lead us towards being more like Jesus. I pray this for myself. I pray this for each one of my friends who listen, who, who is listening to this word from you today. Would you bless us, Lord? Would you give us this grace to be transformed more than we've ever been in our lives because we are true followers of Jesus. Never to deceive ourselves again. Bless each and every person here. Bless their households and keep them safe, God. We honor you. We worship you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for your time, guys. I will see you uh, on our Zoom meeting for communion. Thank you for that wonderful message, Pastor John. A quick reminder for everyone, communion will begin shortly via Zoom. For your tithes and offering, please scan the QR code displayed on the screen. Because of your generosity and your contributions, we are able to continue the work. Thank you for your generous heart. If you haven't joined our Viber group, please do so. You may also want to follow our social media accounts, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, so that you could have the latest church-related updates. We shall see you later at 3 p.m. for our Tagalog service and this Wednesday for our Wow Wednesdays. Have a blessed and joyful week, church. God bless you.
this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone, who took on flesh Fullness of God in helpless babe This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones He came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on Him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine the precious blood of Christ No guilt in life Fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry Till final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell No scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand No power of hell, no scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power 